Okay, welcome everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, uh, I'm very pleased that there are so many people here tonight for this important topic. Sexual violence and conflict and emergencies. And first and foremost, I also would like to thank ICRC, with whom we are co-organizing this event and who is hosting us tonight. And um, that is very nice, and you will see that afterwards they will host us also for a little drink and snacks. This event also for Sarah is, marks the launch of a one-week course on sexual violence jointly developed with the ICRC, with Médecins Sans Frontières, with the UNHCR and with Handicap International. And this is also the first time that this type of course is offered in an academic environment and haven't seen the number of people who were interested by the course, we already know that it will be repeated several times next year. Now to delve into the content of the conference. During the last 12 months, this issue of sexual violence and conflict and emergencies has received an unprecedented attention, one can say, at the highest political and institutional level. Some of you may know that in 2013, the United Kingdom's Department for International Development launched a call to action to mobilize donors, UN, engine, UN agencies, NGOs, and other stakeholders to protect women and girls in humanitarian emergencies. And this culminated in the high-level event protecting girls and women and emergencies. I insist on girls and women because you will see that our last speaker will say how this may miss part of the target. In August 2014, there were about 40 partners who had committed to this call of action. And in June 2014, there was the biggest event ever on this topic, the Global Summit to End Sexual Violence and Conflict, which gathered 1,700 delegates and 129 country delegations in London. And in a summary, the chair of the Global Summit, who was the UK Foreign Secretary, stated, we must apply the lessons we have learned and move from condemnation to concrete action. We must all live up to the commitments we have made. I guess this evening we will question this a little bit and say, not only what are the commitments, but what are really the lessons we have learned. And then in September this year, the United States organized a call to action event in New York during the General Assembly following up on these uh, previous events. So it really seems that raising awareness about sexual violence in conflict and emergencies and advocating for a much stronger commitment to action is well underway. So one could say, okay, that's fine, then do we need to do much more? Well, we will all agree, probably, at least here on the panel, and we will see in the ensuing discussion, that there's much more which needs to be done for us to be more and better. There are a number of guidelines that have been developed over the past years on many different aspects of sexual violence in humanitarian settings, so it seems that we know what to do. But there have been recent scientific reviews of interventions to prevent and respond to sexual violence in these settings, which have repeatedly pointed to the very sketchy evidence on which we base our interventions. And while we know a few things, at least, about providing services to female survivors of sexual violence in emergency and conflict, most of this evidence comes from African settings, and we know very little about responding to the needs of men and boys. There's also a dearth of studies about sexual violence in the aftermath of natural disasters. So we should really strive to do better, and we need the willingness and courage to not only share our successes, that's always the easy part, but also our difficulties and failures. The common sharing of lessons learned in negative and positive ways is really essential, I think, to advance our common base of knowledge. So this panel should be a very small step in this direction, and I have asked the panelists to give a brief introduction just on what the organiza their organization's mandate is regarding sexual violence, but then really to focus on what are the main lessons learned up to now and what are the questions and challenges ahead for each of them. Before turning over to the panelists, I will briefly introduce each of them and then we can have just a flow of presentations and don't have to go each time back to a presentation. To my far right, Yves Dacour, 
He started his career as a journalist. He has worked with ICRC since 1992, and since 2010 is the general director of the organization. ICRC has made a very strong commitment to sexual violence, explicitly mentioning it, in it as one of the priorities in its next institutional strategy, 2015-2019. So I guess Eve will tell us about ICRC's experience, but also the plans for the future with regard to ICRC's specialty, which is multidisciplinary approach to preventing and responding to sexual violence. I will then turn to my left in the order in which the panelists will speak. Louise Aubin, sorry, to my right. Totally confused here, sorry, to my right. <laughs> Louise Aubin, who is lawyer by training. She is building on a very long career at UNHCR and currently holds the position of deputy director in the Division of International Protection. She thus oversees the development of policies and operational guidance to UNHCR field operations on a range of protection issues, including sexual and gender-based violence. She will, of course, given UNHCR's mandate, focus particularly on how to address sexual violence in refugee settings and among displaced populations. Now turning to my left, Katrin Schulte-Hillen is midwife and has a long career in NSF. She is currently the International Coordinator of Sexual and Productive Health Care with a strong commitment to improving care for survivors of sexual violence. MSF certainly is the leading organization in this respect, not denying the considerable challenges this presents. So Katrin's talk will particularly focus on issues related to care for survivors of sexual violence. I would very much like to thank Katrin for having accepted at very short notice to replace Thomas Nierle, the president of MSF Switzerland, he has been called on very short notice to give a presentation on Ebola, and Ebola takes over our lives in these days. He will join us though during the discussion and will be available also for questions. Then Chris Dolan to the far left. Chris holds a doctorate in development studies from the London School of Economics. He has worked first with Accord in northern Uganda for five years, then worked with UNHCR and DRC. And then in 2006, he became director of the Refugee Law Project based at the School of Law at Makarero University in Uganda. His major interests include gender, sexuality, conflict-related sexual violence, but in particular directed against men. I think one can say that Chris is one of the rare specialists worldwide on conflict-related sexual violence against men, and of course we'll talk about this topic. So after these brief introductions, I turn over to Eve. Thank you very much, and good evening to everybody. I'm very pleased to, uh, to be with you tonight. Uh, as you've heard from, from Doris, one thing you understand, I'm not a specialist in sexual violence. And that's one of the reasons I'm here today. Because I really would like to say for us as an organization, we've decided that sexual violence need to be tackled and understood by the entire organization, by all of us, with all our differences. And it's a big challenge for, for us to be able to do that. And I was happy, Doris, that you mentioned, as an organization, we really decided sexual violence should be really central to our approach, to our famous multidisciplinary approach. Quickly about ICSC, we're working in 84 countries. Uh, we are very clearly uh, related to uh, violence and armed conflict. Our ambition is to assist and protect people. That's his ambition. Um, and it's inter interesting because we just have introduced to our board four days ago our new budget for next year, our operational budget, our field budget, if you want. And, and it's, it's overwhelming when you see what are the needs right now out there and how complex it is. We will propose an increase, and it's just an indicator of 30% of our own operation. We will increase also our staff by almost 1,000 people next year. It gives you a sense on, on, you know, of, of what we are aiming at and the complexity we're dealing with, I think all of us. So Doris, I'm extremely pleased to be here tonight because I think the question is, can we do better and how? And I think the feeling is, yes, we can do better. And to be honest with you, we are struggling still. So what have we learned so far as an organization when it comes to sexual violence. I think the, diff the first one is, for us, it has been always very complicated to make a link between our commitment and 
actions on the ground. As an organization, we have committed ourselves about sexual violence already 10 years ago. But it could, took us almost, I would say, let's say, five to six to seven years to really make sure that it was not just a few specialists doing that on the ground, but it started to really be something integrated in our operation. So first things we've learned, there is a real gap, even in an organization like the ICSC, between the commitment. We really looked at women in war, for example, very carefully, and make sure that there is, and this gap needs to be, to be managed. And we need to understand what, what happens in organization, why there is such a gap between commitment and actions on the ground. The second thing we've learned, and you mentioned that, it doesn't affect only women. It affects girls, it affects men and boys. And I must confess also that, as you know, ICSC, we do visit inside prison something like 700,000 people a year with a very special modus operandi. We see them, you know, one by one. We are very carefully looking at, you know, being without witness. We are discussing with the authorities based on what they tell us, being very careful the way we handle. But within prison, even with these procedures, we always have found very difficult to be able to grasp the problems of sexual violence when it comes to men. We were much more at the time ready to understand and listen about the women questions in times of prison, but we missed, in fact, the men issue in prison. The third question is we had to shift our approach. And that's what happened three years ago. In fact, we understood that it was the commitment, there was a will to do. We are well connected, we are close. As you know, ICSC, our ambitions, the way we work, we work close to people. We don't work through partner. So as an organization, we are closely related, close proximity of the people affected. So we see them, we are living with them. But we didn't grasp it. And in fact, what we decided was to shift our approach, to shift our protection approach. And what is it is we've decided that in every armed conflict, we think there is sexual violence. So there's no need for us to try to start to prove it that a delegation need to tell us, you know, there is a trend, there is a problem here, let's, let's really do something. No, we decided there is something happening anyway, but it's invisible, it's hidden. And that's what we've learned also, how difficult it is to grasp that. Still today, I was preparing to come to discuss with you. We have few numbers, we have few ideas. We know it's a major trend, but we have few ideas of what it means really. How many are we talking? What are they? How many percentage? So we decided to shift the proof, shift the burden, so our clear assumption is that any, every armed conflict where we operate, there is sexual violence. It's a big, big change for us as an organization. The four things we have learned, and that's two things I would like to share with you. Of course, the medical element, and we will hear from our colleagues in the panel, the medical, the care is absolutely fundamental as the safe part, as a survival part it is. But I really would like to insist on two elements. We have learned that the s famous entry point is fundamental. We have learned that, in fact, what we need to be able is to make sure that people affected, victims of sexual violence, they are not in a situation to share what happens to them most of the time. Most of the time, they're, because they are f in communities where immediately stigmatization will be there, where there is no safe space to be able to share that. There is not espace de parole to do that. And I think one of the critical elements was how do we find entry point? And entry point is not just ICSC. How do we develop that with partners? Could be midwife. We have that in Burundi. Could be a local primary health care. We have that in Somalia, for example. Or it could be Maison de Coute, uh, which is in Congo right now. And it's absolutely fundamental that we give the space. We are very careful about having to make sure that we have an entry point which allow the people to really ask us and have a real discussions about what they care and what is, what is important for them. The second critical element for us is also the outreach program. Being able to really discuss, engage communities, making sure, and authorities of course, making sure that what they stigmatize is not, are not the victims of sexual violence, but are the sexual violence as such. Making sure also that when we do our preventive work with armed forces, with armed groups, that's not just about awareness, but in their code of conduct, in their rule of engagement, in their doctrine, there is clear 
clear instructions that sexual violence is absolutely a no-go. So that's a very strategical element. So entry point, outreach has been critical. And I'm saying that because the fact that it's so difficult to grasp the issue, to understand, to give numbers, is something fundamental. And last but not least, what we have learned also is we need to train our staff. We need to make sure that our staff understand that. We do have a remarkable numbers of clinical psychological in, on, the, on, the, uh, on the ground, which has been extraordinarily helpful having that. But we wanted to make sure also they're helping us to identify the right people, to identify the right entry point. But we want to make sure also that top manager in our organization in the field understand that, that protection coordinators in the field understand that, that in fact our resident staff understand when they do assessment, we try to, to look into that. We know that most of the time when we do assessment, we speak to leaders, leaders of a community. Right? leaders of a group, and we know that these people will find it extremely difficult to, in fact, relay uh, sexual violence. So we know that we have to go one step further, find the right people, and that's absolutely critical. And here, I must say, and I'll finish, Doris, on that one, I'm extremely pleased to see that we have a seminar, we have a workshop uh, of a week, uh, bringing together uh, some of our people, together with MSF, UNHCR, and, and you being really able to work uh, on these issues on how can we do better. I will stop here, happy to continue the discussion. Thank you. I think in terms of um, UNHCR, one of the um, singular aspects of sexual violence has been um, understanding the cumulative impact of sexual violence in terms of a conflict situation and the, in terms of the impact of displacement itself on people. So when we look at society in general, um, I think it's an acquired general knowledge that sexual violence and different forms of gender-based violence are so pervasive in society. As you rightly pointed out, I think we can start with the assumption that sexual violence will be a dominant feature of most conflict situations in which humanitarian response needs to step in. That's not to minimize the work on the very necessary evidence base um, needed to better program, needed to better target our interventions, needed to better understand the different <coughs> layers uh, that we need to unpack to better understand um, survivors of sexual violence. So without diminishing the evidence base work that we need to, we need to um, deepen, it's certainly something that we need to look at very upstream in our interventions and embedding it, as you, as you rightly pointed out, in all of our multi-sectoral responses. Multi-sectoral seems very uh, jargon-ish in terms of humanitarian work, but I can't I tell you how <clears throat> difficult it is to ensure that every sector that you interact with have a deep understanding of what it is that they need to pre-position, look out for, monitor, and then ensure that they do no harm as they deliver services and interventions with a sexual and gender-based violence optic. This requires not a one-off training. This requires constant work. And you and I, Sarah, you made me think that we've gone, we've, we've, um, as a pendulum, we've gone from, you know, very targeted actions, very high visibility um, uh, initiatives on sexual and gender-based violence for decades now to a more mainstreamed approach when we seem to gather momentum, when we, when we seem to be able to really reach out to both our staff and our partners on the essence of sexual and gender-based violence, when we seem to feel like we're at the head of a wave in terms of our ability to know what works and doesn't work, that's usually when we need to retarget again. Strangely enough, I think it, 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 it needs to be a um, two-pronged approach. You constantly need to have dedicated staff, and I'm very happy to see in the room some of our um, senior protection staff dedicated to sexual and gender-based violence in some of the key operations that we have in the world, both in IDP situations and in refugee situations. Why? Not to substitute for our protection staff or other sectoral interventions, but rather to be the most behind in the strategy at the front to be able to drive uh, an intervention in the most effective way possible. Conflict and displacement exacerbates pre-existing gender inequality issues in society. And gender inequality, or rather the fight against gender inequality, 
and empowering different segments of displaced populations has been a cornerstone to most of our sexual and gender-based violence work. So in as much as UNHCR is a responsive um, humanitarian agency, because of our protection mandate, it's very important that we look at building an environment where um, those individuals and groups and profiles most vulnerable to sexual and gender-based violence are able to um, harness and access different services, but also um, different ways of empowering their voice, their knowledge of their rights, but also to exercise these rights. For example, when, when you think of sexual and gender-based violence, of course you think of the medical dimension. You think of the legal dimension, very essential. But there's, so, there's a whole realm of accompanying measures to ensure that either you're preventing or you're not recurring a cycle of violence. For example, working on livelihoods, ensuring that women have access to not just sewing classes, but these sewing classes as a forum for discussion, a confidential, safe um, space to be able to discuss among peers, among other women, among other actors, but also possibly in the best case scenario, having access to an independent, independent source of income, making them uh, again, you know, stronger voices in society, and probably able to engage and exercise some of the leadership and engaging in decisions that affect their lives. This applies to women. It it applies to men. Um, another area when I speak of gender inequality, it's also a deeper understanding of gender. Very often, in the last few years, gender has been equated with women, women's issues, women's empowerment, the role of women in society. But actually, one of the strong lessons that UNHCR has learned is without engaging men and boys, deeper social change cannot happen. Importantly, by engaging men and boys, you're also unpacking stereotypes. And unfortunately, some of these stereotypes might be that women and girls are more targeted or only targeted by sexual and gender-based violence, or more susceptible or lesser susceptible to gender-based violence. This doesn't just rely on evidence base. It's just a simple human rights issue. Looking at sexual and gender-based violence from a human rights perspective makes you realize that as a responsive agency, a humanitarian agency, one needs to set up systems whereby any person at risk or having been subject to sexual and gender-based violence can be identified in um, a confidential setting, a safe setting, and that response measures, programs, can be tailored to who that person or that group of people have been or, or are. And that becomes very, very important. Just a couple of other points I wanted to underscore. Um, one of them is about proximity and understanding populations. One of the um, big push or role that UNHCR has tried to play in the last couple of years is embedding um, uh, uh, deeper appreciation in the interagency context among other humanitarian actors, but also more broadly. The very necessary need to be with the communities. Um, without this understanding of communities, in particular situations, in a different context, you don't necessarily have a, a, a good appreciation of protection risks, and you don't necessarily see the invisible. Um, people at most risk of protection, human rights violations, etc., are not necessarily those who are the most vocal, are not necessarily those having the ability of creating groups and being able to advocate as a group, uh, being able to access their rights. And that becomes very difficult, particularly in very in conflict situations, in active conflict situations where proximity to communities becomes extremely challenged. In that scenario, as humanitarian actors, you can never substitute for proximity and, and, and engaging directly with communities. We've developed um, a, a very extensive um, methodology to engage with populations at risk, and in particular um, uh, uh, with women in uh, the past few years. Um, it was a dialogue process where we uh, spent several days with same groups, including not just the women themselves from, which, from who we wanted to learn more, but their environment. So the men in their communities, the boys, the girls in their communities the local administration and authorities, 
different actors in and around their communities. And we learned enormously. And some of the key things that we learned is that you can never substitute for other key rights of a community, education being fundamental, physical security being another, access to justice as a way not only of combating impunity, but of recognizing what someone has undergone, validating that it was a crime, and then moving onwards for something that might be more transformative. So contrary to the exposition of the two colleagues, we don't have a multi-sector issue. I think in MSF we have a multi-priority issue because we're in age, in TB, in shelter, in nutrition, in everything. So to the question, how can we do more and better, it seems important to look at a little bit of history and look at what have we done over the past years. And putting the cards on the table, the history has started off pretty badly. The recognition between the recognition of large-scale sexual violence in the dynamic of violence in Rwanda and Bosnia, and the decision or the agreement of MSF as a movement to have a systematic response to sexual violence, there was a lapse of 10 years. So it gives you an idea about the complication. It's not that the problem wasn't known. The problem was known. We were in Rwanda. I was in Rwanda. We were in Bosnia. I myself was in Bosnia. And we didn't actually have particular action for women at all, so less for sexual violence. Discussions in boards and MSF boards is the associative dimension of MSF, for those who don't know it, go back to the 70s and 80s, because there have always been spurts of rape. And it's always been pushed away. So it's actually not a medical issue. It's, you know, it's a rights issue. We can't really deal with it. So it took MSF a long time to find its role, to find its medical role. And oddly enough, that medical role um, was found around HIV. It was um, the threat of HIV infection in rape victims that created suddenly something that was quantifiable as a risk. And it was the promise of post-exposure prophylaxis with ARVs that gave the, you know, the justification for MSF to say, here we have a real promise. Here we have something we can promise a patient that can make a difference in their life. So that happened in 1999, at the same time as MSF access campaign for essential drugs, the fight for ARVs in Africa. In Congo Brazzaville, huge emergency around nutrition and where people came back from the pool area in, in Congo Brazzaville with the account of systematic and multiple rape of women and girls. And that's where the whole thing started, with a protocol which is not very different from what we have now, with um, prevention of HIV, hepatitis B, tetanus, um, STIs, and then of course came up immediately the problem, how do we prevent and manage unwanted pregnancy, off of safe abortion care, uh, psychological support and the medical legal document which is required in most of our countries. Nothing much has changed. We're still doing the same medical care for victims of sexual violence. But even in 1999, we stayed in Brazzaville for another four years, about, without ever looking at DRC or any other context. We had this experience, we knew it was happening, we knew what we could do, and nothing happened. So what triggered it is actually not the fact that we saw or did not, because often they're invisible, but the fact that there was the big scandal which changed the, the perspective on sexual violence, the Mano River scandal, which suddenly pointed out that human, uh, humanitarian aid itself could be, with its power imbalance between victims and aiders and all the means that came in, it could actually be the reason for abuse, the reason for favor, sexual favors, or for sexual violence on a large scale. So, yeah, MSF, I think, has done a lot, but, you know, is not immune from needing a little external push. So it's the Mano River scandal, and it's the external pressure that pushed MSF finally to adopt, you know, a systematic approach. And if you look back in history, you'll see that 2003 and 2004 is when MSF projects started South Africa, Burundi, Liberia, Guinea, so Guinea and Liberia around this whole scandal issue, to look at what is the reality of abuse in MSF projects? What do we do to prevent from creating opportunities for this kind of abuse? And obviously, to understand better how can we help victims and 
to find a legitimacy in taking a public position on it. There was some imbalance. There were some people discontent that we talked too much and did too little in the beginning, but I think that's leveled out now. So that's the history, and it shows you how difficult it is, this whole issue of sexual violence, even if we're only looking at the medical part. So the achievements over the last 10 years, um, about 100, since 2004, we have this common data collection on something, so we can actually look over the last 10 years. So about 118,000 victims of sexual violence received care in, 70, in 61 countries from MSF teams. 95% are women and girls, 50% are under the age of 18, with a serious amount of small and very small kids, not to be forgotten. 50% of the projects see between 1 and 10 victims over the period of the project course, or let's say the calendar year, because that's the way we do the accounting, which gives you an idea that even when care is available, it's not necessarily taken up. About 10% of our project, and that's been stable over 10 years, sees 500 cases over a year or more. In the case of DRC, that can be several thousands. DRC has been since 10 years between 40 and 50% of the caseloads that we see every year. Now, if we look over the 10 years, 10,000 cases, or let's say 10,000 people that you're able to assist at least to a certain degree after a situation of primary rape, it's not a lot. But since we're in a conference or a discussion about, conf about conflict and emergency, it's important to highlight that with the exception of DRC, the high caseloads that we see are not in conflict. They're not in emergencies. They're in post-conflict. They're related to violence of urban settings, to migration, and to exclusion. So if we look at what do we need to do better and more, the focus needs to be there. We're very good in projects like PNG, even going into interpartnership violence that stretches a little bit the limits and has some other reflections. We're good in Honduras. We're good in Guatemala. We're good in established programs where we have dedicated staff, clear means we're not good in the onset of emergencies, we're not good in conflict. Why are we not good? That's where it gets tricky. Competing needs is a reality, and that's why I said initially it's an organization that has a problem with a multi-priority focus. We want to do everything. We have reduced stuff, we have reduced means. There's huge needs out there not to be underestimated in situations like recently in the beginning of this year in CAR, there's simply no other actor in place. So it's, it's medical, it's non-medical, it's shelter, it's water, it's everything. And within these priorities and, you know, life-threatening situation, both the aid organization like MSF but also the population have a problem of competing needs. People come for life-saving, life-threatening situations only. They might not want to breach distance and take a risk to come for something like sexual violence unless it's a child that is really heavily wounded. They might not see the necessity and the added value this medical care can bring. So while you're struggling with competing needs and setting up maybe clinic, you also should be doing outreach proactiveness with all that involves in terms of confidentiality. So it's not to be underestimated that in conflict and crisis, competing needs, it's not an excuse. It's not an excuse. It's a reality that we have to take into account. And the invisibility of victims, as my colleague said, needs to be taken into account. They are there. If we don't see them, it's because we're not searching for them. So the question is, do we have the means? Do we have the energy? And do we make it a priority look, to look for them? Some challenges in the medical environment, because only medical looks easy. It's not so easy. So I've recently dug over 10 years of data, so I feel comfortable, even though it's not you know, comprehensive, going into different reports. 50% of the people come within the first 72 hours. That's the time we need for the prevention of HIV. That's the time we need for emergency contraceptive. After that, the effect of contraceptives, emergency contraceptives is two more days, but it's reduced to 50%, so you need a backup plan. Follow-up. Um, about 50% of the full treatment of um, post-exposure prophylaxis can be confirmed. There is some more because they get the whole treatment to take home, but a lot don't come back to confirm it. Vaccination, the same thing, 
even worse. We do not think that they go for follow-up hepatitis B vaccines in other health centers because most of the time there are none. So we have a problem of follow-up. Prevention and management of unwanted pregnancy. After 72 hours, the management of pregnancy, of unwanted pregnancy, is basically the only highly relevant medical action that you can do. Emergency contraceptive is well accepted in basically all countries, Honduras apart, but you know, basically, and it's very well accepted by women and girls. Basically all accept, they want to take it. Safe abortion care or abortion on request, as we say it, termination of pregnancy on request, to be very clear is a huge challenge. Even though there's many provisions in many countries that make allowance, there's internal challenges, perception challenges, external challenges, legal challenges, but I underline the internal challenges. Even in an avant-gardist organization like MSF, there's a lot of resistance. So to put numbers on the table, one out of five projects in MSF that has sexual violence care reports on the availability of either safe abortion care or an established referral service. Gives you an idea. It is happening, it is in the policy, it's part of the medical protocol. We're struggling with it and external, the context externally obviously doesn't help. Some donors position don't help, like the US. Psychological care, like everything else, very low return. So we're turning to an approach which is much more the psychological first aid, which very much includes what you alluded to to say, a guilt thing, a fear thing, it's not your fault, you're a victim, you're right. And the medical legal certificate, <coughs> which is like a, you know, it's a paper that shows you are recognized as being a victim of this. Moving forward, strategy and plans. Maybe we're a little less developed than ICRC on that. We have a, pilot, uh, we have a common policy, and that reads, all MSF projects should be prepared to offer medical care to victims of sexual violence independently or as a complement of reproductive health activities. It's a statement. We all should. We don't have that in place yet, but the volunteer is there. We also have a common medical protocol, which is very extensive with all the points that I just gave you. We do not have a common strategy. We do not have a common implementation guideline, and we have an issue with terminology. And this issue in terminology, that is my opinion, is hiding or is symbolic for an issue that we have around objectives. It's difficult to delimit, you know, to limit your objectives. As you alluded to, and every time you deal with sexual violence, you come to the limits. You see a girl or a little boy that comes back two times, you start to worry about the protection. You, Anna, you, you do a medical examination of a minor, you have to deal with consent form for minors. You do your medical legal certificate, you deal with confidentiality. You deal with everything all the time. You have a woman who's been raped, who will no longer be married. How is she gonna survive? If you don't give her a possibility of training on income generation, she's gonna to turn to prostitution, very likely. So the limits are there all the time, even though all we wanna do is the medical, every time you touch this issue, you have to think further. <clears throat> now there's not in every place organizations that are willing to do the other things, that are able to other th do the other things, and sometimes you have the organizations, but they are so interlinked with political parties and polarized population that you have to be very careful where you actually refer the victims to and if they're going to keep the confidentiality the way you do. So we have a big issue around our own objective, how far we want to go. Um, briefings and trainings are existing, but they're not systematically at coordination level. Um, we have a an SRH training that deals with sexual violence, but also with reproductive health in general, abortion, all the other issue, PMTCT, it's a very large scope. And there's the recent initiative of, of MSF here in Switzerland to work with SERA, ICRC, um, Handicap International, and the UNHCR on a coordinator's level. Um, am I passing my time? I'm very quick now. Oh, largely? So, general, very quick wrap up. Can we do more and better? Yes. Do we have limits as MSF? Yes, we do have limits. So, what seems important is to reinforce the capacity to respond to the medical, to medical needs in a transversal way. And I refer to what the colleague from the ICRC says. It's not a matter of psychological, of psycho, psychologues, psychologues, 
Okay, mental health people. And midwives, <laughs> sexual violence needs to be tackled by everybody because it's not only medical, it's all the other stuff. <coughs> so we need coordinators to be aware of, we need the desk, we need the political support to make this a, a transversal issue. Um, we need to include basic information into every single training and briefing, reinforce the specific training like the one we have now, but also direct field support. We need to invest, continue investing into these vertical projects that we have and where we have the high caseloads because that's where we learn. That's where we learn how to simplify treatment and that's where we learn the reality of the dynamics, the social dynamics out of which sexual violence is born. When we pass from conflict to non-conflict, like in Liberia and Burundi, we see, for example, numbers don't go down. The age of the victim goes down and the perpetrator changes. So we have this, you know, we're learning by doing these, these vertical projects. We also need to continue challenging an MSF role to expand the medical care for victims of sexual violence, but we need to stay vigilant and maintain independence from political pursuits by national and international governance, however promising they might seem. And that obviously refers to some of the issues that we have in DRC with the fight against impunity, which sometimes backlashes on, on issues of confidentiality and shuts down our capacity to offer neutral and independent medical care. Um, it's really a privilege to be invited to speak here today. My remarks are somewhat different. I'm not going to focus so much on what my organization does in particular, but talk more about the, the general discourse on gender-based violence. My remarks draw generally on extensive research since the early 90s with conflict-affected populations in South Africa, Mozambique, DRC, and more specifically upon my experience running a refugee law project, which is a community outreach project of an academic university in Uganda, and where we work with refugees coming from around the Great Lakes region, Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia, and so on. Now in that role since 2006, where we provide legal aid, we provide psychosocial, psychosocial support, um, <clears throat> we realized early on that we required to, a conscious effort to reach out systematically to male survivors of sexual violence as well as female. And I think I can safely state that we are one of only a handful of organizations in the world, apart from UNHCR, um, that proactively addresses this issue and that has played a lead role in advocacy drawing attention to the plight of male survivors of conflict-related sexual violence. <coughs> Our experience indicates that to do more and to do better in responding to sexual violence in conflict, we need a sea change in current thinking about the scale and impact of sexual violence against men and boys. <coughs> this form of sexual violence was reported in more than 25 conflicts around the world since 2000. But only 3% of NGOs working on sexual violence say that they do anything to do with male survivors. In our own work with refugees coming into Uganda, where we have been able to do systematic screening and we have been working <coughs> on developing a screening tool with Johns Hopkins to do just that, the results suggest that one in three male refugees coming out of Eastern DRC has experienced sexual violence in their lifetime and nearly 14% of them in the year before we screened them. At least one third of the people that we're then interacting with require some form of medical intervention, sometimes including multiple operations, surgery, and extensive treatment to, to, to deal with infections and the like. That's just the physical, let alone the psychological, that's a much longer story. So I can say safely that in, in our work, when we, we look at our figures, one in three of the GBV survivors that we work with is male, and those are people presenting themselves to our offices. So if in a year we deal with 1,500 clients, 500 of them will be male and 1,000 will be female. So one of the field of gender-based violence has been built organically on the foundations laid by decades of feminist activism, <coughs> 
And while this history is embodied in the entire field of gender and gender-based violence, such figures, one in three, indicate that the monopoly of victimhood that women and girls were long presumed to suffer is actually not nearly so clear cut. And the attempt to hold on to these assumptions in the name of pursuing gender equality is counterproductive and short-termist. Whether we look at statistics from Libya, Liberia, DRC, Uganda, even the US military's own sexual assault statistics, or whether we look closely, and you have to look closely because it doesn't come to the surface easily, look closely at the transcripts from the International Criminal Tribunal for U Yugoslavia, ICTR, and now the ICC, it's clear that an important minority of the constituency of sexual violence victims is not only being silenced, they're not getting the support that humanitarian and human rights principles suggest that they need, deserve, and have a right to. I believe, therefore, that we're at a critical juncture in the development of the field of GBV response. We could very easily go in the, the direction of more, much more, of the existing pattern focused on women and girls. Alternatively, this necessary quantitative increase, and I do believe that we need a quantitative increase in attention to women and girls, but it could be combined with a more qualitative broadening and deepening of GBV response. In the latter scenario, doing more, doing more means extending response services as well as prevention and mitigation activities to include all victims and survivors of sexual violence regardless of their gender. Alongside responses for women and girls, we need almost similar levels of supportive interventions for men, boys, and, and we haven't even mentioned this, those who do not fall into a simple heterosexual male, heterosexual female gender binary. So what I'm saying is it doesn't mean diluting existing efforts to work with women and girls. It means seeking and getting the money for a major step up in our response capacity. Doing better means building an empirical base. We heard from the first speaker, we just don't have the figures. But where the figures do exist, they don't confirm the story that we're constantly told by the GBV discourse. That means we have to recover and take further the argument that gender is a construct and therefore susceptible to change. We also have to address the attitudinal competencies or incompetencies, I would say at the moment in general, the legal and skills gaps and institutional biases <coughs> to ensure that first line respondents are not obstructed before they even get underway. My own understanding of the field as it currently stands is informed by long-running advocacy on this vision of a more generous, a more inclusive, and a more multipolar approach to gender. It's also based on the pushback that I regularly encounter from what, for simplicity's sake, I would simply describe as mainstream organizations that are very heavily invested in providing GBV services to women and girls and don't want that patch of turf disturbed in any way whatsoever. So rather than getting into naming any of them, I, I want to restrict myself to, uh, <laughs> to identifying a number of broad characteristics of the field. First of all, the pursuit of gender equality along a simple male-female binary has been allowed to take precedence over an impartial analysis of what is actually going on in the domain of sexual violence. It has also been allowed to suppress the development of an impartial humanitarian response to all victims. Despite there being far greater recognition these days of sexual and gender non-conforming minorities, the nuances of which, which this should have brought into the whole understanding of GBV <coughs> has not, in fact, done very much to trouble what I still think is a very simple oppositional zero-sum binary around which GBV awareness was developed and around which the gender equality agenda continues to be structured. The second main point is that much though the acronym SGBV, which I kind of, when I first started working on this, I, th I thought that was the acronym, sexual and gender-based violence. 
much though that acronym has been, the S has been dropped in favour of GBV or gender-based violence, supposedly in recognition of the fact that sexual violence is far from the only form of gender-based violence, in reality, GBV is still understood by most interveners in the field as being shorthand for and synonymous with sexual violence, which itself is seen as synonymous <coughs> with women and girls. Where non-sexual forms of GBV are recognized, they largely relate specifically to women, female infanticide, female genital cutting, widow inheritance, and so on. My third point <coughs> is that even though GBV is seen as synonymous with sexual violence, it is a curiously asexual sexual violence. I'm sure you're all familiar with the mantra, rape is about power, not about sex. I would love it if somebody at the end of this session could come and tell me who actually said that first. Because I've asked all my good feminist friends and they can't tell me where it comes from. Now, I think it's a useful mantra in some ways because it emphasizes that gender power or the attempt to reassert it may be central to understanding what drives the perpetrators of rape. However, it's not clear to me at least that excising sexuality and the place of power within sexuality from discussions of sexual violence against women is going to help us to get to the root causes. Furthermore, it's not clear to me why the mantra that rape is about power and not about sex does not seem to be applied when, with nearly the same enthusiasm when it comes to discussing the rape of men. Somehow, when you're talking about the rape of men, it gets much more confusing. And when you're talking about the rape of men, people say, well, it's not gender-based. In other words, there isn't a power dimension to it. So you start wondering, wow, it, it all starts to become very confusing. This is a very confused field, I would say. My fourth point, the GBV discourse and practice widely reflects the convenient assumption that gender-based violence is that violence which affects women more than affects men. Violence which affects men more than it affects women is not generally seen as GBV, despite the fact that the many physical and psychological harms which the men involved, for example, in forcible militarization, the, the harms they're exposed to would statistically be much less likely to happen to them had they had the fortune to inhabit a differently gendered body. The sexual violence affects men less than women, but is nonetheless motivated by the same gender constructs as the violence affecting women. So the, the patriarchal gender constructs about masculine superiority, feminine subordination, which you see played out in sexual violence against men, conflict-related sexual violence I'm talking about here. It's increasingly acknowledged at a rhetorical level as gender-based violence, but it is not yet being acted upon as GBV by the interveners. To address these points requires new knowledge, changed attitudes, the development of new skills, it also requires generating a significant political will. For new knowledge, it's already been said, we need to be actively looking for those whom gender logic, and I do think the proper gender logic tells us that men and boys and so on can all be victims. <coughs> we need to be looking for them even if they are rarely seen. The statistics thing goes backwards and forwards. Eh? When the statistics tell you that there are hardly any male victims. MSF only saw 5% out of its 100% were male victims. That means there's no problem. You know, that just doesn't wash. The, the statistics are very, very problematic. I personally think that one of the solutions is to do more systematic screening of specific uh, populations affected by humanitarian crisis. When we have done it, it has given us a completely different picture of what is going on in terms of sexual violence. And I gave you the figures above. In terms of attitudinal change, I've said it. You, I, I think we have to have a shift in perspectives on sex and sexuality. I think we simply cannot deal with, and we will never deal with sexual violence if we treat it as an asexual phenomenon in which we only need to look at the power part. 
And I think um, as we try to understand the complex relationship between power, privilege, threatened privilege, sex, identity, and violence, we have to suspend our personal political aspirations to sex as something which happens and is defined by equality between those involved. When I speak of the development of new skills, I'm referring to a range of sectors. Medical doctors need to be trained in how to work on the damage done by sexual violence. They need training how to deal with kids that have had this kind of violence. They need training for how to deal with men and with women. How do you deal with fissures? How do you deal with crushed testicles? How do you deal with temporary or permanent impotence? These are questions that most medical doctors never get trained in. They need that training just as they need proper training to properly repair the damage done by sexual violence to women and girls. Counselors need to learn how to help male survivors speak up. Social workers need to recognize the many clues that point towards a husband and father being a victim of sexual violence. Humanitarian workers in fields such as nutrition, shelter, water and sanitation, they need training so that they can be aware of and <coughs> respond to the specific needs of male survivors in humanitarian settings. Controversially, I'll leave it to the last, I think we, we need a major shift in the way that gender is taught. I'm going into the politically incorrect terrain here, but in Uganda we sometimes come across people that we describe as one-eyed gender experts. We need experts who have both eyes open, and ideally they would have a third eye that sees all those who don't fall into the gender binary. And I must say, I'm really delighted about the course that I just spent the afternoon training on, which is why my voice is disappearing. But it's one of the first times I've been in a course which is specifically about gender and sexual violence, in which the, the gender balance was pretty much perfect. So I'm <laughs> congratulations on that. And finally, I said to get to the above, to get all of the above to happen, needs a lot of political will and a shift in political strategy. Ignoring one third of victims because you think that doing so uh, will enhance the cause of gender equality is wrong. It's morally wrong, it's empirically wrong, and it's practically wrong. We need to find the political will to go back to humanitarian principles, to go back to human rights for all, and to think forward to the consequences if instead of putting in place evidence, rights, and needs-based responses, we simply do nothing to change the status quo of mainstream G GBV work. I'm nearly done. Can I, do I have one more minute? Half a minute. No. I, I, just to end, I mean, I, I sound like I'm being really negative. I'm actually very optimistic that we're at a transition point. And <clears throat> there, there are a lot of signs that change is underway. There are a lot of changes at a rhetorical level in the language that is being used. At the global summit that happened earlier this year, there wasn't a single keynote speaker who did not reference women, girls, men, and boys. Not a single one. The fact that the majority of the, well, actually 99% of the organizations in the NGO fringe were working on women and girls doesn't matter. The rhetorical shift is beginning to happen. And I think my, the US government, I mean, goodness, if it's the US government, they are the only government I know of at the moment that is consciously funding work on sexual violence against men and boys. And I hope that they are <coughs> a trend setter in that regard. My final point is there's a lot of discussion about engaging men and boys. Great, it is important. But let us engage with them not just as actual or latent perpetrators, but also as actual or latent potential victims. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I would very much like to thank the four speakers. We have gone a little bit over time, but I think there's so much information in what has been said. And before going back to the speakers, which I will do at a certain point, I first would like to take questions comments from the audience and then go back. Just to say the points I will come back to so that you can have them in your mind. Um, certainly one thing which was a big issue is competing priorities and I think it comes out everywhere. And that is really something in the humanitarian response, how are we going to deal with those competing priorities? 
Another issue I think which came up quite a lot is we cannot do it alone. I think Catherine was the most vocal on this one. I guess it's true for everybody, even if not everybody has said it, what does this mean we can't do it alone? How can we work together in a meaningful way? Here I'm not talking about big coordination mechanism, but where is really the difficulties and where can we do better in that? And certainly also, you just mentioned, Chris, we need more knowledge, new knowledge. I think this whole thing about what knowledge do we really need, it would be get good at the end to get a perspective from each of you where you really think is the crux of the matter right now from your perspective given the mandate of your organizations. And the final point really was political will, shift in strategy. Now we heard how long it took in MSF to get the political will going. We heard that in ICRT they have taken a big step forward now. So I think this how do we get to the political will, how well can we come to strategies which really will make a difference is another issue which is still a little bit out there. But let's first, I think there are microphones. Where are the microphones going around? Yes. So please just raise your hands. We'll take perhaps a number of questions, we'll see how it goes, questions or comments, and then revert back to the panelists. Who is brave enough to start? Great. Okay, my name is Noah, and I'm studying at the Graduate Institute here, um, doing my master's, and I'm currently writing my thesis on a topic uh, related to this. Um, I have two questions. First, um, something that didn't come up at all, um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a bit on your organization. What do they do for perpetrators? Um, what care is there, uh, especially since many perpetrators are, are former victims as well. Second question, um, it came up twice about the training of uh, national armed forces and also peacekeeping forces. I think um, it was mentioned once by you that um, actually these one-off trainings are not very successful and that we need constant work. Um, from what I know, most of these armies only get pre-deployment training. Um, so where do you see the power and potential of those trainings and how can those be expanded upon to really be effective in informal military culture? Hi, my name is Sophia Walsted. I'm from Sweden. Um, I actually have a question um, regarding if there is within the panelists' respective organizations a blueprint that has perhaps been developed um, that has been created as to perhaps open a channel um, for allowing specifically male victims of sexual violence access to legal redress, um, perhaps as the training for staff in the field or something similar. Thank you. Well, hi, my name is Tony. I'm an intern for UNAIDS and Gender Equality and Diversity here in Geneva. And I just had a question for the lady representing MSF to talk about how interesting you, you say that your entry point um, for conflict sexual violence um, came from the connection with HIV. Um, with the work that we're doing now in gender equality, was we're looking at the lack of evidence-based connection, the link between sexual violence and HIV prevalence and how the conversation is you need to have evidence to back it up. The way that evidence link between IPV um, and HIV has been made. Do you think that the reasons why the data isn't there is based on um, inadequate assessments, inadequate data collection in M&E, or do you think that um, the trends might be different than IPV? And has this at all, this lack of specific data, the way that IPV has the data for HIV and that type of gender-based violence, um, has that in any ways hindered your work or caused any barriers for MSF? My name is uh, Eran Bashar. I'm, uh, I'm a student at the University of Geneva. Um, my question uh, relates to the different organizations um, working in this, on this subject. Isn't there a risk of having a conflict of interest between the organizations themselves? Like maybe uh, we saw this maybe in Haiti after the earthquake in 2010. Uh, how that many humanitarian organizations and NGOs were active and that it seemed like not much was being done, even though there were tens and you know, twenty I don't know how many organizations, but a lot of organizations in Haiti. And isn't there a risk that having these many organizations, I mean, we all have four here, but uh, that there is a conflict of interest between your organizations? Thank you. Is it conflict of interest or competition, just to be clear about the question? Uh, right? Competition, competition. Yeah. I think there was, there clearly were 
black holes in what has been said in the panel, and it's interesting that uh, some of the questions point to those black holes, and clearly one is perpetrators. What do we do about perpetrators and talking about like sexual violence against men? That's one issue with men, but perpetrators is another one, and which is a hot potato. So it would be interesting to hear from those who want to say something on that, what is about the perpetrators. And then there were more specific questions to uh, some of you. Um, also, training national armed forces and pe peacekeepers. I wonder if perhaps that would more be here on my right-hand side. Are there any success stories which would be interesting to hear? Uh, um, as a refugee organization, of course, if one of, if a perpetrator is a refugee, one doesn't lose. It, it's kind of like uh, you, you don't use uh, different means of punishment that are unrelated to the crime. So a, a refugee remains a refugee with all the rights attributed to a refugee, whether it's ensuring that um, an asylum seeker has full access to uh, refugee determination procedures to assistance, etc. One thing that we do, and of course we focus on the needs of uh, survivor sexual and gender-based violence. And in our whole, UNHCR, we've issued a, a fresh policy, if you will, on access to justice in the context of sexual and gender-based violence. And one issue there is very much working with communities, not just for the impunity factor, but I mentioned, perhaps it didn't go um, fully um, it wasn't fully picked up, but it's the transformational aspect of access to justice. It's not just all about recognizing what someone has gone through, but it's because of the impact of sexual, gen uh, sexual and gender-based violence on a whole community, particularly when we're talking about a conflict situation of a, or an entirely uprooted community through displacement, um, working with the community on what's happened and uh, looking at access to justice as a transformational aspect because of the impact on the community I think is very strong. So I guess in a roundabout way when you're making me elaborate this a little bit, um, there, uh, there are uh, deeper consequences for the perpetrator and it is about it, trying to eradicate the cycle of violence. When I mentioned the um, extensive dialogues that um, UNHCR and partners had conducted with hundreds of um, refugees and internally displaced people um, in group situations, and we tried to under understand and unpack um, the, the root causes of sexual and gender-based violence, um, one of the uh, striking features of these dialogues revealed that most persons who had been victims of sexual and gender-based violence had been severally. In other words, it wasn't a one-off uh, thing. And so the cycle of violence and the repetitive cycle of violence, I think, has a lot to do with your, with your question. What we do about perpetrators, it's also how we handle the crime, how we handle the impact on communities, and how we handle the needs of a survivor or someone at risk. And I think in that respect, I think we help perpetrators in a roundabout way. Um, you mentioned a, a few uh, really interesting questions, and I'll, I'll bounce off on just a few very summarily. Competition. Um, uh, there's never been uh, a, a more numerous state, a more numerous number of, or numbers of actors on this stage of humanitarian response from professionals and long-standing interveners in terms of you know humanitarian response and protection work to new actors to improvised actors and and groups sometimes so the professional aspect of response in humanitarian settings i think needs to be um is an issue that's being tackled and through coordination alone i don't think we arrive at that so i think one of the contributions of this course is also identifying um, the need for deeper knowledge, a more um, scientific approach to some of our uh, to some of our work. Um, so uh, training is one th one thing. Uh, recognition of standard operating procedures in most of agencies, I think, goes a long way. Codes of conduct, I think, go a long way as well. Um, competition, I think, unfortunately exists, but it's also, and I think I'll switch this or I'll spin this as a very uh, motivating aspect. It keeps us all honest as well. And I think, um, at least from a UNHCR perspective, it's been extremely rich to interact and learn from different UN agencies, international NGOs, 
but I have to underscore as well, groups um, who work like uh, what Chris is uh, spearheading in Uganda to really deepen and move our work forward. On that point, I think um, uh, the work, um, the very uh, scientific and elaborate explanation that Chris has given is one of the reasons why I think we're gaining ground in sexual and gender-based violence. A copy-paste approach to programming, uh, replicating programs from one context to another has reached uh, an end state, if you will. And until we, like I say, we deconstruct um, uh, from a gender perspective uh, what we have in different contexts, I don't think we're going to see very much more progress in sexual and gender-based violence. Political will and strategies, I think that that was a very um, spot-on question. I think um, there's, uh, I think we need to recognize that there's an inordinate and inappropriate emphasis on humanitarian actors in the settings that we're actually talking about. In conflict situations, if you, we don't understand the modest role that humanitarian actors play, I think we've missed the point. Yeah, when I say that, um, and uh, as an agreed starting point, that sexual and gender-based violence is a pervasive feature of all of our societies, I don't think that the, the modest contribution that we make in humanitarian settings alone will be able to eradicate or even start making a dent in the change that really needs to, be, needs to happen. Most governments do not collect sex and age disaggregated data on sexual and gender-based violence. Some humanitarians do, many uh, protection actors do, but there you go. If, secondly, uh, m many governments do not promote uh, uh, the presence and hiring and training of female law enforcement officers in many of these settings. In many situations, we cannot get um, law enforcement and judicial processes to appropriately handle sexual and gender-based violence issues. And in many, in fact, most situations, we cannot get adequate protection, physical protection, for those who testify in some of those, the few cases that actually go to court. And I could go on and on and on. Political will, one thing, I really like the way you opened um, this whole session when you said that moving from uh, condemnation to action is what's required. That is very much at the epicenter of the problem, political action to get things going. To coming back to your questions, we do not have ICRC specific program for perpetrator, but we do try to understand what's the motive. I think it's critical to understand what is happening. Do we? And I think I need to link it. I think there are situations if you want to again discuss uh, protection. Uh, with the very same people who are, in fact, giving instructions for animal to rape, you have to understand what is happening. What is it? The political will? Is it a peer pressure? Are we talking something different? You, you do have to understand that, and that links me to armed forces and the program. Awareness is not enough. They are aware. I mean, awareness is not enough. It will never ever make a difference. And not only when we talk to sexual violence. You are in a very difficult situation. Soldiers or armed group, they intervening. I mean, it will not happen. So I think the critical issue is how do you make sure that within, if we start with a regular army, within doctrine, within training, there is a zero tolerance for sexual violence. That's what it is. You can otherwise, I mean, if it's just about awareness, it will never ever happen. You have to make sure, coming back to what you said, Luis, about the political will. So I think for us, when we discuss, when we work with the army, I mean, this is the critical element. Now you ask me, do we have some nice story? Yes, we do have few story which happened over the last 10 years. And in here, what worked was one of soldiers was in fact sentenced within, in fact, the army for a life sentence, for example, for behaving. I think the pressure on the rest of the soldiers was extremely efficient. Do we have the same type of positive uh, feedback when it comes to non-state armed group? Very limited, very limited. But non-state armed groups sometimes do understand very well in some region that they have a responsibility toward the population, so they can play with it, but sometimes they're also very careful about what they do. But it's a very complicated element. It's not just about awareness, again. It's really making sure that within their structure, within a chain of command, when they have a chain of command, instructions are very clear. That's the critical element.
I just would like to also uh, uh, comment on one element, which is about the entry point and HIV. You mentioned that, uh, uh, Catherine. For us, something we have learned over the, the last few years is that in program we've had nothing to do with sexual violence, like a missing program. We do have missing program to try to find the missings, where we had psychological and mental health support. Through this program, suddenly, you know, came, we obviously gave the space to have people, exactly what you said before, coming with, in fact, their case. And we were able then, as an entry point, to be much, much more aware of what was going on. So I think, again, it shows, and we mentioned that, that it needs to be a transfer transversal issues. You cannot just, as an organization, decide that you have a sexual violence program and isolate from your own program. And that's the critical element, because you need to make sure that in your organization, you would recognize that people will come with this kind of issues and make sure that you understand what to do. So I think it's very important that we understand that within our own our program, the psychological, for example, and mental health support are absolutely critical for us when we deal with sexual violence, but throughout all our program. So that's, that's possibly the, 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 the critical element. So I'll, I'll come back to the HIV point. I think, don't remember, I think it was you who mentioned it, right? I think we have to look at two things. You look at it from a public health point of view, the correlation between sexual violence and HIV prevalence. We looked at it from a search for what can be the added value that MSF can have as a medical organization towards a victim of sexual violence. And the appearance of HIV, and at the time, if we go back to, to those times, 1999, that was a death sentence. So it gave a, a way of, you know, it, it gave this death threat and this quantifiable risk to a secondary, so an, an, a consequence of rape could be that. And that's what made the trigger to say, we actually, we know the victims take a risk to come to us for, for, for medical care. There is a balance between the risk and benefit. We know it's difficult for them. If we don't have anything to, to offer to them that is really relevant medically, then we don't feel that we, you know, we should take charge of them. And it is that change. So it's the, the, the fact that, the post-exposure of pro prophylaxis was a promise. It was something that you could really, a promise that you could keep towards a victim that would improve their life or at least not expose them. So that's the way it meant it. That didn't mean the correlation between sexual violence and, and HIV prevalence. Now, I, I uh, continue, I'm not gonna, I didn't understand the blueprint one. I'm against blueprints, they never work. Legally, we have guidelines on, you know, not specifically male, but we don't make a separation. So it's male, female, and, and, and children. We have a guideline regarding the medical legal certificate and everything that has to do with confidentiality, with consent, and with assent. However, <laughs> it gives the basic guidance, and we have a legal department that, in fact, has to respond case by case because it is so complicated, especially with minors, especially with minors whose parents are separated, who's going to be the legal responsible? So for me, if that was the question, we certainly don't have a blueprint. We have some basic guidance, and then we deal with the legal issues case by case. Perpetrators, we don't have any action in favor of perpetrators for future integration and so on. The place where perpetrators have most um, created reflection in MSF is in post-conflict situations where you have a high incidence of sexual violence in minor and amongst minors. And where you are confronted with a situation that as a medical person who has gone the, gotten the témoignage from a minor patient, you realize that there's a very fine limit between consensual sex and the desire of an adult to actually pass that as something that is sexual violence with a perpetrator who's also a minor involved, which creates huge problems. So just to say, you know, very well taken into account, especially when we go into the environment of minors, the issue of perpetrators is a very, very tricky one. And, you know, the, the, the dealing, and obviously they would need, but MSF does not have a specific program on that at all. Um, training of armed forces, I'll pass, and then, the, the, the competition, that was you. In a lot of, in a lot of contexts, I think we'd like a little bit more competition, a little bit more actors that are actually on the ground. I think the problem is not so, especially if we look at Haiti. Haiti is an excellent example of a, you know, aid overkill and little that you see. I think the problem is 
in in how organizations position themselves and in this kind of virtual mapping that is happening where people say, I will do something, but then the funding doesn't come and the people don't come, and you realize months afterwards, every absolutely nothing has happened. And that's certainly something that has happened in Haiti, where we saw, yes, there were actors everywhere, but I mean, let's go back to cholera. How long did it take for people with all these people in place to actually tell? So I wouldn't say, you know, the, the, the competition in terms of, you know, of, of being on each other's feet. I think the problem is maybe that organizations are sometimes a little bit too positive in what they will be achieving and saying, okay, I'm blocking this space, this is what I'm gonna do, and then you realize it's actually not being done at all. But obviously there's, you know, there's, that's a huge other conference. Um, about the question of perpetrators, I think, it was an interesting question. What do you do for perpetrators? You know, to me, there's a prior question: is who who is the perpetrator anyway? And it's not always that clear cut. And I think we have legal systems that want a clear cut perpetrator, clear cut victim. But as somebody else already mentioned on the disc, on the panel, people often occupy both those positions at different times, and they go in and out of the different positions. And so you could be doing something for a victim and inadvertently helping a perpetrator. So I think, you know, I, I, I think we just have to be very careful about being too categorical about where the cutoff is between the two. I think if you're looking at groups that are generally considered as perpetrator groups, notably armed forces, where there are statistics, there's a very interesting study from Liberia in 2010, which showed that a third of male ex-combatants in Liberia reported experiencing being victims of sexual violence, much higher than among civilian men. It was like 33% of ex-combatant men and about 7.2% of civilian men. Uh, so, you know, who's the victim and where's the victim? We need to just be very careful. I do think that there are <coughs> categories of people, particularly people that have gone through DDR processes, people that have been through amnesties, that I think we should be looking at very closely and trying to understand what has their experience of sexual violence been. Even the military sociology is not clear about you know, how sustained are command structures when it comes to sexual violence. The whole argument about when is rape a weapon of war, you know, there's an excellent book saying, is it a weapon of war, question mark? Because the military sociology, the jury is out on whether or not there's really a clear line of command responsibility or not. If there is, then we have to ask ourselves whether the people who perpetrated the violence did it out of their own happiness and free will, or whether they were ordered to do it, and what duress were they put under to do it, and if they didn't do it, what would happen to them? So you, know, you start raising a lot of questions. The question about a blueprint to allow more rare victims um, access, uh, I don't think there is a blueprint. I think sector by sector, what we're going to see, and we're already seeing it to a certain extent, is that people will try to create guidelines on working with women and girls, and then one day they'll wake up and say, whoops, we forgot the men and boys. And <coughs> we've seen that. There's a, there was a protocol on investigating crimes of sexual violence was developed in the run-up to the Global Summit this year. After the Global Summit, we had to have a workshop on, you know, what, what, what would that look like if you're investigating men and boys? When we finally get to the end product of the men and boys protocol, it will be an annex to the primary protocol. You know, and I think we're going to see that in so many different areas. There'll be a protocol on working with women victims of rape, and then one day we'll get an annex at the back of the book talking about how to work with male victims. Um, I think there are, <coughs> there are a couple of key documents, that I think, or one in particular, that I always talk about, which I think is a major obstacle at the moment, which is the IASC guidelines on GBV and emergencies, um, which is a, a hugely problematic document from this perspective. It has a lot of good stuff in it, but it is entirely about women and girls at the moment. Whether the revisions will address and integrate men and boys, LGBTI, we shall wait and see. But as it currently stands, it's a document, we used it in the, in the course this afternoon just to look at it a little bit. You know, it just tramlines you into a discussion about GBV against women and girls and it's, 
it becomes very difficult to look outside that box. Um, so I think that one, if you're interested in blueprints and things, you should look at that one as a problematic example. Um, I think the other thing which I, I think I wanted to mention there was that it's not just about what the organizations are doing, it's about the laws within which all of this stuff takes place. And until we get law reform, particularly in many, the many countries where definitions of rape are one-sided, definitions of perpetrator are one-sided, etc., it, it becomes really difficult to create that access, even if you want to. And that's you know it's a problem that we're facing in Uganda at the moment in our work. And that then speaks to the issue of competition. Now there's not that many organisations out there that want to work with male victims because it's difficult, and you do come face to face with all sorts of cultural norms, all sorts of religious norms, all sorts of gender norms that nobody wants to touch. And so the competition at the moment is not very huge. I, I kind of echo you. I think a little bit more would, would probably be quite a good thing. Yeah. I have seen that um, one of our panelists has arrived, <laughs> who was very well replaced by Katri Massey. I don't know if you would like to make a comment. I just wanted to come back uh, to two questions. Uh, First one, and uh, I think uh, uh, the fact that I was delayed uh, is typical uh, for MSF and for the place uh, uh, sexual violence is occupying in, in our organization. Uh, there was a conference on Ebola and I had to go there. Uh, I think it is a symptom of uh, even an organization which is, which is very aware of uh, uh, the, the, the problems which our teams in the field are facing in terms of uh, uh, sexual abuse uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a directorial management level. Uh, there are always other priorities, uh, of course, linked to the uh, current situation in West Africa, etc. I think this has, has to change, and I think we have to work on it. Um, a second thing I, I, I wanted to add is, um, I think uh, uh, what, we're, what we're doing, and it probably has been said before, and I'm, uh, I listened to Louise, and I think it's right, uh, we have to be very, very mod modest and humble in what we can offer, but what we can offer is a space of confidentiality. Um, to, uh, of course, we have to offer uh, uh, assistance to physical trauma, we have to offer uh, psycholo psychological support if needed and uh, to an extent uh, wanted. Um, uh, but of course, uh, this space of confidentiality is as such uh, a space in which uh, uh, a certain degree of human dignity can be regained after a de dehumanizing experience, which can be a sexual ass assault. Um, and of course, this space of confidentiality is as well open for perpetrators. Uh, although I don't think that there are many uh, coming uh, to us and knocking at our doors, uh, but of course there may be a psychological trauma uh, behind uh, a given act of, uh, of violence. And I think as a, as a medical organization and myself as a medical doctor, uh, if there is a psychological distress, stress uh, uh, linked to uh, a given situation of, of sexual assault, I think we have to listen to, him, to them and we have to as well to see if if uh, we can assist uh, medically, psychologically, uh, these persons in order to, uh, um, uh, in order to regain some self-confidence and perhaps as well uh, uh, get out of uh, uh, a vicious circle of being victim and perpetrator all the time. Uh, nevertheless, I think uh, we have to be modest and I don't think that we are able to uh, provide much in this kind of situation, but still I think as a, as a, as a medical uh, uh, Doctor, I think it is our, our responsibility as well to keep this space open uh, for those who perpetrated the violence. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Are there any questions, particularly on this side? We can take three or four more, and I think then we'll come to a close. Yes. Hey, my name is Sarah Cotton from ICRC London, our mission in the UK and Ireland. And I just had a question, really. We've been talking about, many of the panelists have been talking about women and girls and men and boys. And I just would be really interested to hear the thoughts on on children versus adults, and for that matter, adults who are able-bodied and um, have, who are 
who are educated or have particular attributes versus adults who may be particularly vulnerable in another way. And this is something that we have seen through a lot of work that the ICRC is doing at the moment in Northern Ireland of sexual violence. And the fact that the character of the sexual violence there in the last 50 or so years has really been affected by the identities of those the victims. So, for example, children who are victims of historical abuse in, in children's centres versus men who are victims as initiation part of an initiation into an armed group, and then women who perhaps still um, are victims of uh, routine violence as a result of, of, of being in a particular vulnerable situation. So just thoughts on that. Thank you. My name is Linda. I'm a legal trainee here at the ICRC. And all of the panelists spoke about the social issues behind sexual violence, but how much do those issues exactly like how much they affect your work when you're on the ground because I can imagine a lot of societies where in fact victims are encouraged to kill themselves, where they're encouraged to never come back home, where they're in fact actively discouraged from resuming any sort of life. So, and especially the perception of these organizations as being Western, how much does that affect your work? Because traditionally in the humanitarian area, like healthcare and purely humanitarian relief, they are not subject to these controversies, but sexual violence must be a whole part of issues, as I can imagine. I'm from India, so I can <laughs> imagine pretty well how, how that can be. So if you could enlighten a bit more on how your organizations deal with those issues, and when these victims are actually married off to members of armed groups, do organizations accept those marriages? Do you try to when you come across a situation like that, when it's not an outright case of sexual violence, but of forced marriages, then again, there's a big conflict with the social more. So how do organizations deal with these issues? Thank you. Hi, my name is Rose Bell. I'm from Uganda. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding uh, the approach of international organizations, you know, victimhood versus survivors. You know, I have worked with sexual violence victims in Uganda and uh, the ones we call victims, but most times they prefer to say, okay, I'm a survivor, I'm not a victim. How do you balance this kind of terminology to, so that people feel empowered rather than you being there to help them because they're helpless? Um, the other question is, what, how do you deal with the situation when, uh, in terms of uh, justice, um, most often we are dealing with non-state actors, but how do, you, how do you handle situations when it's the state actually behind these crimes? Uh, do you see any uh, particular challenges? I've see that, I've seen that in Uganda in women trying to get uh, access to justice uh, where armed forces who are still in power have violated them and it's very difficult. How do you even support that after the conflict has gone? Thank you. So I think there were four questions, I will not repeat them, who were just asked right now. And I would really appreciate if the panel could also quickly, those who it's relevant, huh? not everybody necessarily, but just the one thing, can you do it alone? So that doesn't perhaps apply that much to Chris, but it, certainly to the three others, in particular to Louise and Eve, because Catherine already touched on it. And the one question also, which knowledge do we need to gather, and how will we go about that? Chris, would you want to start this time? The, the cannot do it alone question, absolutely. I, I think if you want to, certainly if you want to get a wider appreciation of the problem, then you need more and more stakeholders involved. And you have to suspend the interest in being the only organization to get a grant, for example, in, order, in, in, in exchange for building momentum. <coughs> the new knowledge, I think I've always spoken, my, my view on it is we need to, to integrate it, I, I guess you would call it operational research, but that you do screening and that you build statistics on the basis of screening in humanitarian situations. Um, the question of children versus adults, I think is a really interesting question, and I could talk for a long time, I won't. <coughs> but, um, you know, I think it's, I actually think it's really important that we distinct, uh, differentiate. You know, I always get a bit worried when people say women and girls, women and girls. I think it also tends to infantilize women to always lump them together in the same breath as, as women. And I think when you talk about men and boys, we, we actually generally, in our own work as Refugee Law Project, we don't talk about men and boys because we don't work with boys, we work with men. 
and the, the gender logic of the attacks on men is not the same thing as what is happening in sexual abuse of boys. It's a very different gender logic. <coughs> so I think it's, there's a challenge in how do you keep them um, you know, differentiated. In terms of the question of how you work on the, the kind of social dynamics and <coughs> if you're working with survivors that everybody else wants to stigmatize, how do you deal with that? There's no simple answer, but one of the, the ways in which we do it is we encourage people to set up their own groups. And what we've seen is when people set up their own groups and they create, basically they create new structures, they create new sources of identity, they create a new sense of respect. And the fact that there are other people out there who don't want to engage with them becomes less important than the fact that within the group, they have re-established a good social dynamic in which there is some mutual respect and listening and so on. I mean, I could talk a long time about it, but it's, that, that would be one answer anyway. Um, the question of victims versus survivors, we had a long discussion about it this afternoon. Um, and <clears throat> I will just say what, exactly what I said there, which I don't think it's for the service provider to decide whether someone is a victim or a survivor. I think you can, you can have your own opinion as an observer of the person, but it's for that person to determine whether they want to be referred to as a victim or a survivor. And I've, I've, I've come across both, in both directions. Um, the question of dealing with justice, you're from Uganda, you talked about the women, it's the same problem with the men. Um, the, the, the extensive rape of men that happened in northern Uganda in the late 80s was perpetrated by soldiers of the current regime and has never been brought to justice and I, I don't expect that to happen anytime soon. Very difficult to know exactly how to go about it. So on, on women, children, men, all I can, I can tell you, we try to just address them as, as um, those three groups, to say victims of sexual violence, referring to um, women, men, and children, knowing that children is a, you know, it's, it's a serious amount of people. I mean, I, I said that before, it's 50%. If we go by the age of majority of 18, with a 13% of, you know, 13 years or younger, so that's, that's a key group that we're dealing with. I'm, I'm, it's going to take too long to go into all the things. Victims and survivors, long discussion. Um, I said in, in my presentation, we have an issue with our terminology. Things have meanings attached to them. And survivor, by definition, is somebody who has exceptionally overcome a life-threatening situation and that is seen as a very happy event. Um, as has been said in you know, MSF discussions about that, in a lot of times, sexual violence is not used as a means to kill people, it's used as a means of terror. So the outcome of actually surviving such an act is not really a happy one. So there's some contradiction in that. We have other people who've, you know, just near close call with their CD4 counts once they got the, HI, the, the ARVs, they have rebound and would be survivors. And MSF, in the policies and in the documents that we all agree on, we use victims or patients. Because victim refers to the, to the legal language, and it has a legal implication, and patient is the medical language and the, the action that they need in terms of medical care. So that's the decision. I would have colleagues that would contradict that. They're very much into the gender and survival. We're going to have to have a little discussion about that internally. Not quite done yet. I'm going to concentrate on knowledge and data, because that's my thing. That's, for me, it's on, on two levels, and I'm going to be the one who's going to be critical on that one. I've recently received a anthropological study of one of my colleagues that has come out of I don't know where in Nairobi, 170 pages on sexuality, sexual violence in um, in the suburbs, you know, the Matari, whatever, in, in Nairobi. It was nerve-wracking, honestly. I mean, it came up 170 pages to say poverty and promiscuity contribute to sexual violence. Well, you know, that is kind of no news at all. So I'm having a little bit of an issue with too much study because sexual violence, especially sexual violence in conflict, is something that is as long known as humankind exists. 
It's I take the property, I take the territory, I take the castle, and I rape the women. It's a possession thing. It's always existed. Now, there's many things to that. So I think we have to be very careful on what do we want to know. There's a very interesting article that has been written by Claire Magone in, in the... In the um, Diffit um, thing about data, data collection. We have an obsession with data collection about sexual violence. We actually don't do very much with that data. And I think it's there's an ethical question attached when you deal with a patient, especially in the MSF, you deal with a patient, and you you know confront that patient with all these questions. I mean, it's very intimate. Have you had sex yet? Do you have your period yet? Are you active? Do you think you're age infected? All that in a person who's recently traumatized by that event and then said, did you know the perpetrator? Was there any money involved? So I think there's, you know, there's a very <coughs> fine difference between what will help us to do better, what is data that we need as MSF, I'm only talking about MSF, as a medical organization to be able to ensure adequate medical treatment for a patient. Only that set, only that to know age, weight, when was the aggression, yes or no possibility of HIV, of pregnancy are absolutely intimate questions. That's more than enough for one session. So data knowledge yes we need to understand the phenomenon is behind but i think we all have to ask ourselves is it because we're so fascinated i say that in the nearly morbid thing with this kind of violence because it touches us very deeply and we want to know more about it or are we collecting knowledge that really impacts our capacity to give better medical care, to reach more people, and do more relevant action. So I leave it out there just as a reminder to say there's, there's a lot involved in wanting more knowledge, and some of it is just a, you know, maybe our own not understanding that this kind of violence still continues so strong, and we have to be careful to cap our own desire for understanding something that might not change anything for the patient. The security of persons involved also in collecting data has a lot to do. I've seen very good intentions about collecting data, for example, in regards to LGBTI individuals at risk, which uh, obviously were flagrantly um, baffling in terms of uh, keeping the security of individuals in mind. A couple of uh, quick points, and thanks very much. On, um, uh, um, can, we, uh, can we do it alone? Obviously, obviously not. Um, and uh, I think it's, we've been also trying to ensure that uh, when we talk about sexual and gender-based violence and we, when we, you start unpacking what's required in terms of uh, targeted measures and accompanying measures, evidently we're talking about a lot more than protection actors in the field. We're talking not just about humanitarian actors either, and we're talking about state responsibility, and we're also talking about development actors, etc. And it's been uh, it's an ongoing discussion um, to recognize that some services require expertise. And no, I would not think that many of our uh, UNHCR protection staff, for example, are able to provide. Uh, robust or, or, or um, appropriate psychological counseling to a survivor of sexual violence. I think that is a very um, expert area requiring a lot of, not just experience, but formal training to be able to, to provide. Does it mean that you would therefore refrain from identifying someone who possibly may have been at risk of sexual and gender-based violence and needs to talk? No, of course not. So there's a, um, a, a whole range of um, training, intervention, sensitization, but very much at the core of ensuring that you have that cultural, uh, you know, institutional focus within within the agency to be able to provide this. I think uh, the other part of um, the answer would be a better understanding of the complementary roles of different actors. You were referring to competition and it sometimes it, it makes me think rather that I'm not quite sure we're identifying the roles and responsibilities of the number of actors that we can't spare. There's so much work out there and the challenges to responding to emergencies is so great 
I don't think we can spare by just saying to some, don't you, you know, we don't need your services, but rather I think it's a deeper understanding of what different UN agencies, different actors, different NGOs can contribute constructively and safely to the issue. From monitoring, to reporting, to public advocacy, to denouncing, to prevention, to response. I, it doesn't necessarily mean that no agency can do a combination of these things, but in most instances, you're not going to be able to combine all of this in a single agency. It does require that um, different actors take up different roles in a coordinated way so that we, we, we leverage the roles and responsibilities of, of different agencies. Um, one of the uh, difficult aspects that UNHCR had to tackle a few years ago was actually recognizing that after decades of working on sexual and gender-based violence in displacement situations, um, there were s significant overlooked areas or dimensions of our work. It's very difficult to publish that. It's actually at the core of our global strategy since a couple of years where we named six overlooked areas, and one of them was children. Mm -hmm. The intersection of sexual and gender-based violence and how we actually equip and respond in our, in our operations in regards to the age dimension of vulnerability of um, at-risk populations. Another one was disabilities, persons living with disabilities. Another one is um, uh, the, the phenomenon of survival sex, and you, you, uh, you, you expanded on this a little bit. So all, while difficult to name, without naming we don't have remedial measures like training, like targeted operational guidance, working in partnership and expanding our partnerships to expand also how we work. We've also changed also the way we um, guide operations. Our operational guidance now is so is made to be extremely user friendly and based on programmatic advice. We've got these little booklets called Need to Know, and it's you know the ABCs for everyone, from a field officer to a protection officer to a program officer, to be able to understand how to work with different um, population groups. Um, the specific. Um, cultural, regional dimensions of sexual and gender-based violence. I think that's a very interesting uh, comment to make. It, um, I can't um, uh, underscore enough uh, the need for, again, for working with communities, but also in the context of, of emergencies, I think our better responses were um, uh, supported by pre-existing knowledge of a uh, particular society, community, country, etc. It's almost an anthropological approach to protection. We, um, a, a better understanding of um, uh, cultural um, minority groups and how they're treated in a particular society may have an impact on in terms of the vulnerability of that group to sexual and gender-based violence. The role of women in a particular society also, and how it's perceived, how it um, uh, works through systems, will help you understand also um, um, how to respond to sexual and gender-based violence in the course of an emergency. So a lot of pre-existing knowledge needs to take place. And I would simply um, finish by saying that and in recognition of some of these characteristics in recent emergencies, and Syria is certainly a case in point, uh, the whole issue of child marriage. And we've made it a theme, of, as you know, uh, across the UN um, during the, the um, 16 days of activism um, to eliminate uh, sexual violence. And we've made um, child marriage as one of the themes to be able to push that forward and, and deepen our understanding on this. Interesting, when I'm listening to, to the panel, it gives the impression, and rightly so, that's a very complex issue with a lot of different uh, elements of that. And my message would be the following one. We don't need statistic to act, right? I think data are important, and I totally agree with Catherine, but we don't need statistic to act, possibly. And I think you would, maybe the key questions for me is about the knowledge you mentioned. It's about also the political will within our organization, what we want to do. And I think that, that's a critical element. And, and here, as an organization, what we need to be able to do is two things. Is we need to balance knowledge in terms of making sure we do have to have specific knowledge. It's true to integrate that in our organization. 
We don't have at the ICSC a lot of clinical psychological psychologists to help us. We need to have them. They are very central to our program. But you, you cannot just decide they are the one who will respond. Not at all. Then it's absolutely critical that our manager understand in the field what it takes when it comes to understand, to identify, to really treat, to care, to prepare an operation which will deal with sexual violence. This is critical for us. So that's also why it's so important, and I really would like not to underestimate what you're doing here, having quite a number of you coming from the field, from different organizations, doing a workshop together on sexual violence. I think it's a critical element for me. So no, we cannot do alone that. That's very critical. And it's not just about guidelines. Here I agree with, with what some of you said. We've seen a lot of guidelines coming up. Uh, they, some of them are interesting, but it's not enough. I think we need to make sure that there is exactly the will and I think the push to make sure that it happens. Now, on, on two or three things I just would like still to, to say, one is the social issue. Um, I could more, not more agree about what you said about the difficulties for, in some communities, for the victims, just, or for the people affected, for the, uh, for the survivor, whatever you call it, to just, in fact, be able to, uh, to come across. I mean, so it, it's, it's very clear for us, and we see that with MSF, I think, as an experience also, is uh, we need to make sure that we found entry points which are not us. We have to accept that people maybe sometimes will not come to us as organization. We need to be able to identify entry points uh, in, a, in the communities. We need to be able to also to do outreach program, which will help to, in fact, create the link between the people affected and possibly the care. And possibly it's not us. So the entry point still for me is absolutely a central element. And last but not least, um, I think I see that there is an awareness, there is an interest, but I think I quite agree about, again, what you said before. Uh, there is a link between condemnation and actions. I think we need, we need to be able to move into, into actions, and we need to develop more, uh, uh, absolutely, a larger focus. So far, if I look at ICSC, our focus was very much in Africa and Colombia. And we need to be able to deploy this type of response in a, other area. You mentioned Syria. If I look at Syria, if I look at Iraq right now, I mean, we need to be able to tackle this question. It's a very complex one. And I think we need to be agreed, we need to agree that it's not something which you can move easily, but I think as a commitment, we need to be able to look into that. And in, we need to make sure that also we help our, our different delegation. You, you, just, <laughs> you just mentioned also Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a good example, and it is very complicated. But as, as really, as an organization, we need to be able to commit. That cannot just be an Africa focus. We need to move out uh, from the fam famous DRC focus uh, uh, and make sure that in our operation we have, uh, and it's the case, now in the ICSC, much more context uh, where we looked at the sexual violence uh, uh, questions, absolutely. And certainly I'm not going to try to summarize anything here, but I think what is striking, I mean, first of all, I think this was a kind of first off event also, what we have here tonight, having three major humanitarian organizations and a very special actor from on an issue which has not been debated before, I think, in this forum here in Geneva, quite critically looking at what's going on. I don't think there has been, like, you know, lip service to anything here. I think it is really, we're all saying it's a complex and difficult issue. Now, if these actors say it's a complex and difficult issue, imagine what it is for smaller organizations, organizations who have less resources and so forth. So I think we also need to be very aware that we are starting something, even it's, if it's already more than 20 years old, Rwanda, Bosnia, it took a long time to get to this point, but perhaps there is a dynamic now which allows to, to move forward. Um, I just want also to clarify, knowledge for me is not gathering more data on how much sexual violence is out there. That's not what is meant, and I think you said it, Catherine, it is about having more relevant response let it be for the prevention or for assisting survivors or victims. And we don't know enough there. And I think it came up throughout uh, that we're missing a lot of pieces of the puzzle still to know how can we do better in different contexts, in different situations, out of Africa, as was said. And I think that's where our knowledge base really needs to be improved. Um, and finally, it was said not inordinate emphasis on humanitarian actors. But I think at the same time, what came out very strongly is the impartiality of humanitarian action and the neutrality in terms of offering a neutral grounds for a confidential space are essential and will be very difficult to fill 
by other actors in these types of situations we're speaking about. So there clearly is a special role. Humanitarian actors cannot do it all, but there clearly is a special space for humanitarian actors which needs to be filled well. Thank you all very much for having been here for two hours. This was a long uh, discussion with very interesting questions and feedback from the panel. You are now invited to, there will be people guiding you because we go upstairs into the ICRC restaurant for the drinks and snacks. So just follow the guide, so to speak. And thank you very much. Have a good evening.